Song of the Lark by Willow Cather. Fourth subchapter. I'm on page 11 at this point. And it was summer, beautiful summer. Those were the closing words of Thea's favorite fairy tale, and she thought of them as she ran out into the world one Saturday morning in May, her music book under her arm. She was going to the Kohlers to take her lesson, but she was in no hurry. It was in the summer that one really lived. Then all the little overcrowded houses were opened wide, and the wind blew through them with sweet earthly smells of garden planting. The town looked as if it had just been washed. People were out planting their fences. The cottonwood trees were flipper with sticky yellow little leaves, and the feathery tamarisks were in pink bud. With the warm weather came freedom for everybody. People were dug up, as it were. The very old people, whom one had not seen all winter, came out and sunned themselves in the yard. The double windows were taken off the houses. The fermenting flannels in which children had been cased all winter were put away in boxes. And the youngsters felt a pleasure in the cool cotton things next to their skin. Thea had to walk more than a mile to reach the Kohler's house, a very pleasant mile out of town toward the glittering sand hills, yellow this morning with lines of deep violet where the clefts and valleys were. She followed the sidewalk to the depot at the south end of the town, then took the road east to the little group of adobe houses where the Mexicans lived, then dropped into a deep ravine, a dry sand creek across which the tr railroad track ran on a trestle. Beyond that gulch, on a little rise of ground that faced the open sandy plain, were the Kohler's house, where Professor Wunsch lived. Fritz Kohler was a town tailor, one of its first settlers. He had moved there, built a little house, and made a garden when Moonstone was first marked down on the map. He had three sons, but they now worked on the railroad and were stationed in distant cities. One of them had gone to work for the Santa Fe and lived in New Mexico. Mrs. Kohler seldom crossed the ravine and went into the town except at Christmas time, when she had to buy presents and Christmas cards to send to her friends in Freeport, Illinois. As she did not go to church, she did not possess such things as a hat. Year after year, she wore the same red hood in winter and a black sunbonnet in summer. She made her own dresses. The dresses came barely to her shoe tops and were gathered as full as they could possibly be to the waistline. She preferred men's shoes and usually wore the cast-offs of one of her sons. She had never learned much English and her plants and shrubs were her companions. She lived for her men and her garden. Besides that sand gulch, she had tried to re reproduce a bit of her own village in the Rhine Valley. She hid herself behind the growth she had fostered, lived under the shade of what she had planted and watered and pruned. In the blaze of the open plain, she was stupid and blind like an owl. Shade, shade, that was what she was always planning and making. Behind the high tamarisk ridge, her garden was a jungle of verdure in summer. Above the cherry trees and peach trees and golden plums stood the windmill with its tank on stilts, which kept all this verdure alive. Outside, the sagebrush grew up to the very edge of the garden, and the sand was always drifting up to the tamarisks. Everyone in Moonstone was astonished when the Kohlers took the wandering music teacher to live with them. In 17 years, Fritz had never had a crony, except the harness maker and Spanish Johnny. This winch came from God know where, followed Spanish Johnny into town when that wanderer came back from one of his tramps. Winch played in the dance orchestra, tuned pianos, and gave lessons. When Mrs. Kohler rescued him, he was sleeping in a dirty, unfurnished room over one of the saloons and had only two shirts in the world. Once he was under her roof, the old woman went at him as she did at her garden. She sewed and washed and mended for him and made him so clean and respectable that he was able to get a large class of pupils and to rent a piano. As soon as he had money ahead, 
be sent to the narrow gauge lodging house in Denver for a trunkful of music which had been held there for unpaid board. With tears in his eyes, the old man, he was not over 40, he was not over 50, but sadly battered, told Mrs. Kohler that he asked for nothing of God than to end his days with her and to be buried in the garden under her linden trees. They were not American basswood, but the European linden, which has honey-colored blooms in summer with a fragrance that surpasses all trees and flowers and drives young people wild with joy. Thea was reflecting as she walked along that had it not been for Professor Wunsch, she might have lived on for years in Moonstone without ever knowing the Kohlers, without ever seeing their garden or the inside of their house. Besides the cuckoo clock, which was wonderful enough, and which Mrs. Kohler said she kept for company when she was lonesome, the Kohlers had in their house the most wonderful thing Thea had ever seen, but of that later. <coughs> <coughs> Professor Wunsch went to the houses of his other pupils to give them their lessons, but one morning he told Mrs. Kronberg that Thea had talent and that if she came to him he could teach her in his slippers, and that would be better. Mrs. Kronberg was a strange woman. That word, talent, which no one else in Moonstone, not even Dr. Archie, would have understood, she comprehended perfectly. To any other woman there, it would have meant that a child must have her hair curled every day and must play in public. Mrs. Kroonberg knew it meant that Thea must practice four hours a day. A child with talent must be kept at the piano, just as a child with measles must be kept under the blankets. Mrs. Kronberg and her three sisters had all studied piano and all sang well, but none of them had talent. Their father had played the oboe in an orchestra in Sweden before he came to America to better his fortunes. He had known Jimmy Lind. A child with talent had to be kept at the piano, so twice a week in summer and once a week in winter, Thea went over the Gulch to the Kohlers through the a Ladies' Aid Society thought though the Ladies' Aid Society thought it was not proper for their preacher's daughter to go where there was so much drinking. Not that the Kohler's son ever so much as looked at a glass of beer. They were ashamed of their old folks and got out into the world as fast as possible, had their clothes made by a Denver tailor, and their necks shaved up under their hair and forgot the past. Old Fritz and Wunsch, however, indulged in a friendly bottle pretty often. The two men were like comrades. Perhaps the bond between them was a glass wherein lost hopes were found. Perhaps it was common memories of another country. Perhaps it was the great vine in the garden, naughty, fibrous shrub, full of homesickness and sentiment, which the Germans had carried around to the world with them. I can't finish this chapter. I've got to back off. I'm sorry.